Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today our special guest is a man I'm proud to call my hero. He is the greatest diver who ever lived. He's won 47 national titles, five world championships and five Olympic diving medals, including double gold medals in two consecutive Olympics. What an incredible honor to welcome Greg Luganis to our program. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thanks for having me. Greg, your book, Breaking the Surface, first came out in 1995 and spent five weeks at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. For me, that book is so incredibly powerful because although you described yourself as insecure and weak, you actually demonstrated astonishing strength and determination and resilience. Have you been able to look back and actually reconcile the weakness that you were feeling with the strength that you were actually showing us all those years. Yeah, I mean, that really happened on book tour when uh, Eric Marcus, my co-author and I were, went on book tour. Uh, the people, I mean, thousands and thousands of people showed up and you know, for me to sign the book and get their pictures taken. And the stories that they shared that, uh, you know, that they were able to come out about their sexual identity or about their HIV status to their friends and family through my book. And so I, I learned that by sharing my perceived weakness, I was actually sharing my strength. And it was so em empowering and and so gratifying people coming up and saying you saved my life you know is it you know it, it truly you know brings the point home that you know you make a difference everybody makes a difference by sharing themselves and sharing themselves completely you were badly bullied as a child because you had dark skin and you had dyslexia and they called you a sissy and worse but it's your reaction to that bullying that i found so fascinating i got the sense from your book that the bullying actually made you angry and motivated you to succeed. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, for, you know, I, I, I wrote this little piece, you know, that I, I almost want to thank the bullies in my life because it really motivated me to really kind of push to be, um, you know, the best that I could, I could be, you know, to kind of show the bullies, you know? And so, yeah, it was, it was motivation. Um, and, you know, and I, I always wanted my performance to speak for itself. I mean, because when I started school, I stuttered. I was in speech therapy. Um, I learned later that I was dyslexic. Um, I didn't learn about dyslexia until I was given dyslexia as a vocabulary word in my freshman college English class. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm not, I'm not all of the names that they called me. Uh, I'm, I'm dyslexic. So, um, you know, so that was interesting. And, and also, I mean, doing work with, um, you know, with the learning difference group. It's a learning difference. It's not a disability. We can all learn and we just learn differently. And finding that, that way that we learn is, you know, it's, we're creative. You know, it really kind of uh, delves into your creativity. But I think that message that you gave to kids who may be being bullied out there, which is a horrible thing, that if you can channel that anger into a motivator to be the best that you can be, you can actually achieve something that maybe you wouldn't have before. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, in, in the back of my mind, as I was <laughs> getting my face, face pushed in the asphalt, you know, the fight at, at, the, at, uh, at the bus stop, um, you know, I was thinking, just wait, <laughs> I'll show you, <laughs> you know. Boy, did you ever. <laughs> Greg, your mother was immensely loving and supportive, but your father was, well, to put it mildly, an emotionally abusive authoritarian. Uh, for me, the most heartbreaking part of your book that still haunts me is where you were being beaten up by a school bully and your father just stood there and watched. He didn't help you at all. How did you ever manage to forgive him and repair the relationship with him the way you did in the end? Well, you know, I, I did. I, you know, I, I did take care of them the last six weeks of his life. And really when um, the last year he, he was diagnosed with cancer. And so then it became a, um, you know, a, 
a journey towards health and, and wellness, taking care of ourselves. And so one thing that, that I learned is, you know, he, he wanted, he did the best that he could with the, with the tools that he got, because both of his parents died when he was quite young. And so he didn't have a role model as far as what a father meant. And so, you know, it's just like understanding that, understanding his background, that he was only doing the best that he could. You know, he didn't want to see me throw my, you know, my talent away. And so, you know, we had some struggles and, and he addressed that, you know, in that last year when we had conversations, we talked about how we honor not so much the, you know, the quantity of life, but the quality of life. And so that was kind of our journey together and, and journey of healing and being able to talk about these, you know, these things that happened. Um, and truly, I mean, he, he was doing the best that he can with the information that he had. And he did it in such a way that, you know, that, you know, he knew that that's the only way that he knew. Now, before we leave the issue of parenting, there's an important message in your book about parenting talented kids. Your mm -hmm. father only really took an interest in you when he saw that you were a talented diver, and then he became driven to make you win at all costs. You actually say in your book that winning was your way of trying to make your father love you. What do you say to all those stage mothers and fathers out there who are pushing their kids too hard to make them win? Well, you know what, I had a wonderful kind of balance, you know, my mother, you know, her, her attitude was go out there and, and have fun. Uh, and uh, I mean, because when I was doing dance and acrobatics, I had a partner. And my partner, Eleanor Smith, you know, her mother was a bit more of the, you know, stage mom, you know, pinch your cheeks, bite your lips, you know, before you remember this transition, you know, and my mom was just there and she just said, you know what, have fun, you know, keep smiling, have fun, you'll do great. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it was great. I mean, I, I learned so much from my mom, um, you know, as far as the expectations, I mean, coming from that place of desperation that I had to win in order to be worthy of my dad's love. Um, that's a very desperate place to come from and it's not sustainable, you know? Uh, so I really had to find that, that power and that motivation within myself and also the love of, of my sport, you know, of, of diving. You know, unfortunately, I had an incredible coach, my coach, Ron O'Brien, you know, he was so wonderful. He, you know, understood me that I was a performer. I wasn't really a competitor. And so, you know, he tapped into that and really kept me motivated, kept my, my eye on, on the progress, you know, progressing. Well, you've made a big point in the book about talking about unconditional love being so important to a child's self-esteem. I'm wondering if you think your love of dogs came from a desire for the unconditional love that you so rarely got as a child and, and as a young man. Oh, for sure. I mean, dogs um, are that, I mean, that's, that's who they are. You know, they are love. You know, they give unconditional love. They're forgiving. You know, if something happens, you raise your voice, you know, they come right back to <laughs> you with their tails wagging, you know? And so, um, yeah, so that was, I, I, I do better with animals usually than people, <laughs> you know, animals are great. You know, people kind of scare me sometimes. I totally get that. Believe me, <laughs> you mentioned Ron O'Brien. I, I want to talk to you a bit about coaches. Obviously a good coach needs the necessary technical knowledge, but you wrote about two coaches you had, John Anders and Ron O'Brien, who made you feel good about yourself. Do you think that's the most important quality of a good coach that they make you feel good about yourself? You know, I, I think it's, it, it's how the coaching is done. And, and that is, um, you know, one thing that I learned from uh, John Anders, one of my, uh, fir my first coach, you know, he, he gave me the inspiration. He said, diving should be like poetry. And so I, I you know, tapped into that awareness because I was a dancer first, 
And so I understand dance and the aesthetics and movement and all that. So then for it to be translated into my movement, translated into poetry, I, I got that, I understood that. And then with my coach, Ron O'Brien, he was so wonderful because like what he would do, he, was al- he, he would always couch his, um, his criticisms. You know, he would get our attention with, uh, with something positive. And then he would put in what adjustments he would like us to see, to see make. And then he would finish on a positive. And so that type of coaching, because you know it's real. You know, and that's the important thing, you know, just to be positive for positive sake isn't real constructive. So you have to make the, you know, the analysis, you, you, need, you need to give an honest uh, assessment of a performance and, and, and be able to learn and grow, you know, and, and also uh, to, uh, you know, to, to reward the effort you know, when people are making an effort, um, because there were some times he, he used to joke with me, my, my Ron O'Brien would, would joke with me that, you know, that I was a sandbagger, you know, because he's like, oh, you're just going through the motions, you know, and then, and then he'd give me like a score goal, you know, to kind of, you know, kind of push my, you know, my buttons to be better than, than what I was giving. And so, you know, to know those motivations and challenge, you know, challenge our youth, I think that's so important. And honesty, just be honest. You said in your book that coaches need to understand that winning isn't everything, life is. What did you mean by that? Well, you know, to have that balance, um, you know, it's not about producing champions on the board or in competition it's it's about producing champions in life you know because uh you know i mean there were so many times i went through uh so many phases in my 20-year diving career uh that my entire self-esteem was wrapped up in how my training session went right and and it's like, okay, if it was, if I had a good workout, I had a good day. If I had a bad workout, I had a bad day, you know? And so it's not balanced, you know? And it's important to have that balance. Um, you know, the one thing that, that I had uh, when I was going to college is I was in the theater, I was in the drama department. So, you know, I can have a bad day at, in, in the diving pool, but then I can go and, and rehearse and, and, you know, for a show that I was doing and, and have a success there. So that, taught me that all of the successes, you know, all of my self-esteem isn't wrapped up in just the diving. So I I had other things to offer. You know, I love that you said coaches need to teach the difference between competition and competitiveness. You know, that, that competition is about you being the best you can be, but competitiveness is focusing on the other people. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I view myself as a, as a performer rather than a competitor. Um, and the way that I, I, I kind of structure it in my, in my own mind, it's like, uh, when I was performing, it didn't matter what anybody else did. You know, I'm not in control of anything except my own performance. So it's my responsibility as a performer to win the judges over. It's my responsibility to win the audience over. It's my responsibility, you know, to do the best that I can in that moment in time. When you're a competitor, it's oftentimes uh, people are, it's not that they, it's not that they don't win. It's, 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 uh, well, they, they don't win because the judges weren't judging well, or, you know, the audience is against them, you know, so they put all of these other elements where they don't have to take responsibility. Right, right. So, you know, of course, I have to ask you this, you began coaching in 2010, you've been a mentor to the US diving team at the 2012 and 2016 Olympics. Are you the kind of coach that you wish you had had? I, you know what I try to be? I, you know, I, I, I definitely try to be, um, and, you know, it, 
it's funny because I was just having a conversation today with a dear friend of mine and we were talking about, you know, how coaches coach. And so many coaches are say, saying, okay, don't do this, don't do that, don't do, but the mind doesn't know the difference between to do something or not to do something. So it's like, you know, if you're going down, skiing down a mountain, you know, it's like, don't hit the tree, don't hit the tree, don't hit the tree. What are you going to do? Hit the tree because you're focused on the tree. So, you know, focus on, on the, the things that you want to see. You know? But and, let's and face it, let's face it, Greg, you had to strike a balance between focusing on pleasing yourself by doing your best and focusing on outperforming your competitors, which was, is what you have to do to win. Well, it, I, my goal was not to win gold medals. I know that sounds contra contradictory. You know, my goal was not to win gold medals. My goal was to perform to the best of my ability. Um, and, and that's what I did. I mean, you don't break world records by thinking, okay, that's my competition, you know, and so keeping an, an eye on them. Because if they miss a dive, chances are you're gonna miss a dive. So you have to have the courage and the guts to leave everybody behind and not worry about what anybody else is doing. Right. That's how you break world records. So let's talk about that. We'll talk about the Olympics. In 1976, at the age of 16, you won a silver medal at the Montreal Olympics. And yet you described that whole Olympic experience as quite negative. Why? Well, you know, I, that, I was diving with Dr. Sammy Lee and Dr. Sammy Lee won two gold medals in 48 and 52 for men's platform. Then he helped coach uh, Bobby Webster who from the U.S. who won in 60 and 64. And Klaus DiBiase from Italy was going for his third Olympic gold medal. Right. So my sole purpose on this planet was to prevent Klaus from breaking my coach's record. So I took, at 16, I took on his goal. Right. So I was living his dream. I wasn't living my own dream. And so I took that on, that, that responsibility on, and I failed. You know, I, I went there to win. I didn't go there to take second. So I was very confused going back to high school, thinking I was a failure when everybody else was celebrating me. So, I think you thought you let the country down because you didn't get a gold yeah. medal and you didn't realize getting silver at 16 was awesome. It took years. I mean, it took you know, many, many years before I could hold that silver medal with any pride. But I mean, I can see that now. I mean, I can see it very clearly that, oh my God, I was 16 years old and I, I was in the Olympics, one. And number two, I was a silver medalist. Yes. So that's, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> I would say so. Um, I just, my heart broke when I, when I read about that experience. You were ostracized because you were gay. You said there was a shocking lack of camaraderie on the U.S. team. And then if that wasn't enough, you were propositioned by one of the diving judges, uh, which is really yeah. shocking. Do you think that happens often? I, you know what? I have no idea. I have no idea. All I know is my own experience. And that was like... I, you know, I was just kind of scratching my head. I was like, oh, I, I think I better, I, I have some friends to meet. <laughs> <laughs> now, in 1980, the United States boycotted the Olympics in Moscow to protest the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, so you couldn't compete. But in 1982, at the World Championships in Ecuador, you got your first perfect score, seven straight tens, and you won. How did that feel? You know, that, it would, it's funny because like in 1982, um, I had already been to the world championships. I had already won a world championships um, and uh, Pan American games and all this other stuff. Um, and so that was the first major competition after the 1980 boycott. And I remember uh, um, Alexander Portinoff was introduced. We go reverse order of finish and this is for the three meter springboard. We go reverse order of finish. So I was the last diver. I won the prelims. And so Alexander Portnoff was introduced as Olympic gold medalist, 1980. And then they said, Greg Louganis, Olympic silver medalist, 1976. And I'm like, I was thinking, 
oh my God. I looked over at Alexander and I was like, thinking in my head, it's like, you won the gold because I wasn't there. <laughs> and so, and so I, I kind of had something to prove to myself, you know, and the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was going through the competition and it came down to the last dive. And I looked at the scoreboard um, just to make sure that the dive number was right. And I saw my score was flashing, which meant that I had already won. I didn't have to do that dive. And so I was like, okay, don't get distracted. Focus on the dive. And, and I focused on the dive, hit the dive. And I think it's still the greatest margin to win uh, a world championships. So, I mean, that was, and, and that was, you know, that's, that's what I want, you know, that, that's what I was, my goal was, was to make a point, you know, and, um, and I was able to do that. And that's when I felt like I really arrived where I belonged on the world stage in this sport. Well, if that wasn't enough, you went on to win two gold medals at the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. I think everybody wants to know, what does it feel like to stand there at the podium during the award ceremony and have gold medals placed around your neck with the national anthem playing? What's going through your head at that moment? Well, it's funny because like if you look at the award ceremonies for the men's three meter springboard and then the 10 meter platform, you can tell the difference. Because when I won the three meter springboard, my, my mind was still was going to the 10 meter platform. It was like getting ready for the next event right. because I wasn't done. And so, you know, I, I was pretty reserved, but, you know, my, my mindset was, okay, next event. Um, but when I won the 10 meter platform and I broke 700 on 10 meter platform, it was just like, ugh, it, it was the floodgates. I mean, it was just like, ugh, you know, because, I, you know, at that time, you know, in um, the national anthem, um, you know, home of the brave and all that. And I was feeling pretty brave. And, um, you know, it was just, it, it was just heartwarming, you know, just to, to have that opportunity. Well, everybody that was watching that on TV uh, was feeling exactly the same thing. Now, by the time you got to the 1988 Olympics, your life was really in a serious downward spiral. You were involved in a viciously abusive relationship. And when I say abusive, I'm talking physical, emotional, and financial. This guy was a real con artist who took complete control over your life, your career. He alienated you socially, even from your parents. There are a lot of people out there who find it difficult to believe that a man, let alone a champion like you, but that any man could ever be the victim of domestic abuse. What do you say to those people? You know, it, 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 it's so important, you know, it, it, self-esteem and self-love. I mean, I, I, I take responsibility you know, for, for that now, you know, I see what my part in, in it was, um, but it, it took a lot of courage. And uh, fortunately I was surrounded by some, uh, some really incredible people to support. And, and oftentimes in those situations, you do need help. You know, you knew, do need to reach out and, uh, and, and ask, don't be afraid to ask for help uh, because, you know, that really is a gift that you're giving somebody else to be there for you. And, uh, and, and also, I mean, to stay strong. But the fact that there is still this stigma, if you're a male, that people are less reluctant to believe that domestic violence or, or, or abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, that it even exists. It has nothing to do with gender or sexual orientation. It has to do with self-esteem. It does. It, you know, it's all about how you see, how you perceive yourself and, in you know, what is acceptable, you know, what is acceptable to you. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, like I, you know, I can think, you know, well, would I allow my dogs to be treated that way? You know, because I love my dogs dearly. I was like, no, I would not, you know, so I would stand up for my dogs. And so you know, it, that's, that's how I, I, I learned to stand up for myself, too. It's well, important you, that we speak up and speak out. You know, there's already a problem with people not taking domestic abuse seriously. 
but male victims are often dismissed and minimized and gay male victims are dismissed even more. So thank you, Greg, for speaking out about this. Sure. I mean, it, it happens, it happens. And just, you know, just find the, you know, the self-love to be able to ask for help. Now, just to give people an idea of how manipulative your partner was, he orchestrated things so that he could be at the 1988 Olympics, but your own parents had to stay home and watch it on TV. Looking back, given the person that you are now, do you find it hard to believe that he was able to get away with doing that? You know, I was in a different place. You know, it was what it was. I, I don't play those old tapes. I learn from them. So I learned the lessons, the lessons that I learned, um, you know, were incredibly valuable. But also too, I mean, I had to step into my own power. I had to step into that, that person that I wanted to be. And so, you know, in, in, and also take responsibility. You know, my parents weren't there. You know, I played a part in that. So I take responsibility. Um, and, you know, I can't take, you know, I can't push all the blame on other people. And I, I think that's something that's really important that, that we do learn to take responsibility for everything in our lives, all the good stuff, but all the bad stuff too. You wrote in your book that breaking up with that partner was a lot more difficult than winning four gold medals. Why? Because the, the, the gold, the, the, the medals, the diving I knew relationships I didn't. So, I think it's because you had to stand up to someone that you felt inferior to. Well, sure. I mean, that's how, that's how that happens. You know, the, the dynamics of, um, of somebody, you know, kind of taking charge or you allowing them to take charge of your life and constructing it and controlling it. Um, and, you know, and I have to take responsibility for my part in that. Um, and, and also, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's really uh, empathetic people who get involved with these types of individuals um, and, you know, and, 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 you know, trying to, you know, make it work and, and, and all that when really they need to look at themselves, you know, and say, you know what, I, I'm better than this. You know, I can stand on my own two feet and, and also challenge yourself to stand on your own two feet and, you know, and, and be the person that you, that you want to be. Now, moving on to the 1988 Olympics, by now your partner had AIDS, you discovered you were HIV positive, you were not publicly out as a gay man or as HIV positive, you were taking powerful medication every four hours, night and day, you're training for the Olympics. Can you see why I say that although you saw yourself as emotionally weak and insecure, you had incredible determination and focus to be the top diver in the world? It's jaw dropping. <laughs> I, like I said, I mean, that is what I was groomed for. That's what I was trained for, you know, from early, early childhood, you know, starting in acrobatics and dance and then evolving into gymnastics and then evolving into, into diving. It was all related. And so that's what I knew. That's what I was comfortable with. And, um, you know, a lot of the other stuff, the social skills, you know, I, I had to build my confidence in, in those areas and challenge myself to step outside of myself, outside of my comfort zone to, you know, to be, uh, in, be in, embrace those things, those aspects, those parts of me, and to realize that there's, there's a lot of strength and power here. That's for sure. Now, for people who are wondering why you kept your HIV status a secret back then, it's important to remember you would not have been allowed into Korea. You might not have been allowed to compete in the Olympics if people had known that you were HIV positive. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at that time in, in 88, um, yeah, if, if my HIV status would, was known, I wouldn't have been allowed into, into, into Korea. 
Now, Greg, I am not going to ask you about the dive when you hit your head, that whole ridiculous non-issue about the blood in the pool, because it's 2021 and everybody knows that there was absolutely no risk of HIV transmission to any other athlete. My question for you though is this, how did you in five minutes after suffering that head injury and being sewn up, how did you gear yourself up emotionally to get back up there on that platform and perform a perfect dive? What was going on in your head? Well, it was funny because my coach, Ron O'Brien, he, you know, he said, okay, we don't have much time, you know, do you want to continue? He said, you know, if you say no, you know, that you don't want to get up back on the board, I'm going to support you hundred percent, you know? And so he asked me if I wanted to get back up there or not. I had two more dives and I said, you know what? I, I don't want to give up without a fight. I said, okay, come on, let's take a walk. And so we took a little, little walk and it, it, we were joking about, you know, hockey players. He said, oh, hockey players, they get 30 stitches and get back on the ice. You got five stitches in your head. It's, you know, it, it, it's just a flesh wound. <laughs> and so, I mean, we, we were just, you know, kind of joking around. Um, but the one thing, uh, you know, because my next two dives were going in the same direction. So then they announced my dive. I set the fulcrum and um, to get set, they announced the dive and I heard an audible gasp from the audience because they knew it was in the same direction. And I took a deep breath and I patted my chest and, you know, because I felt like my heart was beating outside my chest. And so the people in the vicinity who saw that started chuckling because they were, you know, it was like, they were saying, oh my God, you know, he's scared too, you know, and, and I was, and so I didn't know what was gonna happen. I knew that it was the Olympics and I couldn't hold back. So, you know, I had to go forward. And so when I heard the chuckle, I started laughing to myself because I realized all these people are in my corner. And so it really kind of bolstered me up. I said, okay, come on, you got this. And then, you know, did the dive that I did. And it was the highest scoring dive of, of the Olympics, I think. It was a moment nobody will ever forget because you, of course, don't realize it, but millions of us at home were, were, we were in your corner too. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it, 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 was, it was a wonderful moment and, and yes, it's true. I mean, I, I think that the bigger story is the dive after, the, after my hitting my head. Absolutely, that's why I asked you. <laughs> Greg, you've been very open about the mental health issues that you've had to struggle with. You tried to commit suicide three times starting at age 12. You suffered from chronic depression and then finally in your 30s, you found a therapist. Why did you wait so long? Well, I mean, I grew up during a time um, and in, in a place in uh, rural San Diego um, in El Cajon. And, um, you know, the mentality at that time was, oh, you know, you're, you're not crazy. Um, you don't need, need to be committed, that, you know. And, um, you know, so, it, you know, it was kind of that macho mentality of, you know, you know, tough guys, they, you know, tough guys don't cry, you know, kind of right. thing. And so, um, you know, that was the mentality around that time and also where I grew up. So yeah, it took a while, but you know, I'm, I'm glad that I finally you know, got into therapy. What do you have to say to people who are afraid to go into therapy? Oh, the, you know, therapy, it, it, it's such an incredible discovery of self, you know, and, and good therapy is, um, you know, is just a way of getting in touch with who you are, you know, what your goals are, what, what really matters to you, you know, so that you can be um, congruent in what you do, what you say, you know, all, how you present yourself. And, um, and, it, and it's great, you know, that just that in, enlightened spirit you know, of, uh, you know, of being true to yourself, to be your authentic self. I think that writing the book was a therapeutic experience for you because you demonstrated so much self-insight in that book. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it was funny because the process when I was working with Eric Marcus, there were weeks we didn't talk. Because really? I, I was so pissed off because he was digging so deep. 
and you know uncovering a lot of wounds and that I thought I was through but yes it was very therapeutic and um, very cathartic and uh, it was and redemptive yeah yeah so I mean it it, it was I'm not going to say it was a wonderful experience <laughs> It was a challenging experience, and I'm grateful for for the blessings that it, that it has given me. Now, in recent years, you've developed a passion for meditation. Can you tell us a little about your project, Meditation in Motion? Yes, we're having, um, you know, we're doing this course. It's Meditation in Motion, and um, and it's based on all of the things that I learned as a, as a child. Um, you know, working with the breath and body awareness and visualization. Uh, and, and those are the keys to any meditation practice. And so I break it down into small enough increments that, you know, people can really grasp it. Um, a, a lot of the exercises I do uh, that, I'm, that I'm giving in the course are uh, a lot of the exercises that I do at my dive camps. And I've had, you know, a, a young diver as, as young as six, and, and they love the, the visualization and the relaxation and visualization. And, and it's, it's wonderful because, you know, I, so much, so much of everything I do, I visualize. So if I'm having a difficult, if, if I'm going to have a difficult conversation with a friend, I visualize it first. I experience it first. You know, before major competition, uh, I would visualize myself in that venue, you know, with the, with the people and the cameras and all that. So when I show up, I've already been through, through that experience. I've already been there. So it's, you know, visualization is so key and so important in, in how we tap into that and using all of our senses in our visualization work, sense of smell, taste, your hearing, sight, all of those things. I'm really excited about it. We're going to put all the information about meditation in motion on our website. You know, it's great to see you looking, sounding, feeling better than ever and focusing so clearly on wellness and inner peace. It really shows, Greg. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, you've lived a long time um, in the public eye as a closeted gay man. Only a very close circle knew for sure that you were gay, although there were rumors and every gay man, including me, was hoping that you were gay. <laughs> uh, the obvious question for many people is, why didn't you come out sooner? What were you afraid of? You know, it, I, was, I was pretty much out. I mean, when I went away to college, I was in the drama department and, you know, we went to, you know, gay bars and dance clubs and all that stuff. So I was out, I was out to friends and family. Um, but when I signed on with an agent, the William Morris agency in 84, you know, they, they said, uh, tone down the gay thing. I was like, oh, okay. So it was kind of my policy just not to discuss my sexual identity with members of the media. And, you know, my justification was, you know, well, everybody's entitled to a private life, right? And so that was my justification. Um, and, but I mean, I, I see, and, and also I was out to, you know, to friends and family. I mean, even in the diving world, you know, that, that was a whole issue, you know, because the diving team is very small. And when we travel abroad, you know, it's like, you know, they would have a meeting without me and say, you know, figure out who's going to room with the fag. And, and so, you know, that, you know, that was going on. So, you know, coming out is a process and you, you know, doing it for, you know, for the right reasons in, in the right time and also your own comfort level where you are personally, you know, so I don't believe in outing uh, and I believe everybody's on their own journey. Uh, but in, uh, in writing, breaking the surface, I knew that that was my next step for my own personal evolution it is coming forward publicly uh, about my sexual identity, come out publicly about my HIV status. Because uh, before the book, I felt like with regard to my HIV status, I felt like I was living on an island with barely a phone for communication to the outside world. So because I secrets isolate you. 
you know, they keep you kind of boxed in. And so that was just the next step on my journey. And I'm grateful that I took it. Well, here's the thing that amazes me. I actually had to read about this twice in your book. While you were still not publicly out in 1993, you had the guts to play the role of an out gay man dying of AIDS in an off-Broadway play in New York called Jeffrey. It seems so counterintuitive to me that a closeted gay man trying to hide his sexual orientation and his HIV status would take such a role. What made you do it? You know, it was, it was really about facing my own fears. I mean, in, you know, during that time, I mean, that, that was my fear of, you know, dying of, of HIV AIDS, you know, and so I, I was able to live out my fantasies and also live out my, my greatest fear. Um, I think it also, this is just my opinion, but you had to act like an out gay man with HIV on the stage every night before actually having to be that person. It gave well, you like a preparation. <laughs> but everything is, everything is a preparation for what comes next, what comes next in your life. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a great rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Now you've said that when you finally did come out publicly in your book, it was actually anticlimactic. For the most part, the public, the media, everyone took the news pretty well. You saw how much support and compassion there was for you. Did it make you wish that you had come out sooner? No, I mean, because everybody's on their own path, their own journey. I mean, I, you know, I was good with, you know, with my friends and my family, you know, they, they were concerned. Um, and, but they also respected me. They respected that this is, you know, the next step on my journey and they respected that. So, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't have any regrets. I mean, because uh, regrets are wasted energy. Right. And so, you know, it, it is what, what it is. And I'm just, grateful to be here where I am today. Do you think that openly gay athletes today have an easier time than what you went through? Because you opened a lot of doors. <laughs> Definitely. Oh my God. You know, it was, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, um, LGBTQIAI, you know, athletes have a much better time than, than I, I did. But, you know, they, Every generation has their own challenges. Every generation has their own challenges. So, um, you know, you can't minimize in any of that. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, with uh, Gus Kensworthy and uh, Matthew Mitchum and Tom Daly, and, you know, there's quite a few, um, you know, out athletes now. And I think that's wonderful because now, you know, young people have somebody to look to say, oh yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I can be like Michael Sams or I can be like, you know, whomever that may be. Greg, it's been recently announced that a movie about your life is in the works. What can you tell us about it? <laughs> well, yeah, there, uh, um, the, it, it's basically gonna be, you know, based on breaking the surface. So it's a major biopic. And um, I'm really excited about it. I think that we have some, you know, pretty incredible people that are, you know, coming in to make this happen. So I'm really grateful. There was a TV movie about you back in 1997. And then there was a, an excellent documentary in 2014 called Back on Board. I love that this new movie is going to share your story with a whole new generation. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was funny because, um, yeah, because... Uh, Breaking the Surface was uh, a TV movie, made for TV movie um, with Mario Lopez. Um, and I joked with him, I, you know, I should look so good. And we actually grew up in the same area. I went to the same talent contest that he did, um, but much, much earlier than he did. Uh, but it, it, was, it was interesting. And then um, Cheryl Ferjanik, who produced and directed Back on Board, she reached out to me and said, you know, uh, I'm a documentary film director and I did a informal poll 
And she said, you know, if you're at that time when we, before we started shooting um, back on board, she said, you know, kids under the age of 27 don't know who Greg Luganis is. And I want to change that. I was like, oh, okay. So then they moved in with me for like three years and <laughs> saw me through all of these transitions. And, um, and so, you know, it was, it was really wonderful and they did an incredible job. Oh, it was riveting. Now you're a, a well-known activist. You were involved in the fight against AIDS long before you disclosed that you were HIV positive. You made a video for the opening ceremony of the 1994 Gay Games. You've worked with the Human Rights Campaign. You fought against the don't ask, don't tell policy. What's left for you to conquer? Are there any other mountains you wanna climb? Who knows? I mean, you know, whatever comes up, you know, uh, it's, you know, I, I mean, it, and, it, and all of those things are, are, aren't really anything that, you know, that I was looking to do. Um, it was just about doing the right thing at the right time. You know, um, cause like when uh, I, I reached, I was one of the first people to reach out to Ryan White when he came out uh, about his HIV status in 1986. I saw the People Magazine article and I, you know, went to my, you know, my ex at that time, because he was managing me. Um, to, was he ever? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I said, I want to reach out to, um, to Jeannie White and, and invite Ryan to the Nationals, because our Nationals were going to be in Indianapolis. You know, so I was able to share a lot with, with Ryan White. He became a dear friend of mine. Um, I gave him a national medal and then I had Pan Ams in Indianapolis and he was there. Uh, and then after uh, Pan, Pan Ams, I had made my professional dance debut in Indianapolis with Dance Kaleidoscope. And so he was there uh, and it just that relationship grew. I mean, he was my inspiration. Okay, one last question. Do sure. you really get how monumentally important it is that you, a major Olympic hero, came out and you've stood up for yourself and for our community. You're a pioneer. Do you get how proud we are of you and how much love there is for you? Well, I, you know, thank you. Um, but I think we're all just doing the best that we can with what we have, you know, and, and also, you know, to take that step, you know, and, and that's a part of, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, activists aren't real activists, you know, they're just being who they are, sharing themselves authentically and being the person that they want to be and stepping into that. Um, and then all of a sudden you get the label of as activist. Um, and so I think making the next right step, I think that's what, what all of us are doing. Um, some of us a little bit more conscious about it than, than others, but, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for the support and, uh, you know, and, you know, what everybody has contributed to my life. So I, I feel very blessed. I think we're all blessed that you were on this planet. Greg, I'm going to end this interview by saying something that will hopefully tell you everything that I and your millions of fans feel about you. And I just hope I get through it. If you believe within your heart, you'll know that no one can change the path that you must go. If anybody out there doesn't know where those words come from, you must read Greg's book, Breaking the Surface. Greg, it has been truly a life altering experience watching your career, your personal development with such pride, getting this chance to visit with you. You'll never know how much this has meant to me. Thank you so much, Harvey. I really, really appreciate it. I mean, that, I mean that, that's what interviews are, is just sharing. And, you know, if we were in person, I'd be giving you a hug and saying thank you. And I'd be giving you one too. I thank you and your team with all my heart for making this interview happen. I wish you the very best of good health and happiness and success in everything you do. Thank you so much, Harvey. Thank you very, very much for being here, Greg. We'll never forget it. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Our special guest has been the sensational Greg Luganis. A big thank you to Greg's team led by the wonderful Greg Sims. 
Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.